and I'm going to welcome everybody to the, G the GCLS Members Only Book Club, and today we're going to talk to our author, Ray D. Magden, and we're going to talk about her book, Lucky Seven, and we're going to get a little bit extra with Lucky Eight, so that's exciting. That just came out, so we'll talk about that a little bit, and let me go to the next slide here. There's the covers, Lucky Seven, Lucky Eight. I love the covers. I absolutely love the covers. So I'm going to break in here before I'm actually supposed to read the housekeeping, but I want to know who did your covers. Yeah, her name is Rachel George. Uh, she mostly illustrates children's books, but uh, she also does lesbic and sapphic uh, queer books. Uh, and I'm so happy. I'm thrilled with the covers she's come up with so far. Yeah, yeah they're very cool. Yeah, I like She does all of my books. Really? Except for the cover of Fur and Fangs, but okay. uh, all the other ones are by her. Yeah, and they really speak to the story too. They really go on to story goal, so that, that was cool. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and get to housekeeping. Okay, oh, lots of people joined, perfect. Hi, everybody. Okay, so get that out of the way. Housekeeping, I gotta read it or I won't get it right. We'll start talking to Ray in a minute here, but first, housekeeping items, if I say that one more time. This meeting is being recorded, so if you miss parts or wanna watch it again, it will be on the goldencrownorg.org website a little later today after it gets uh, spiffied up and I'll, I'll post the link. Um, all, you, all of you should be on mute unless you're asking a question. Uh, we ask you to do that because it will minimize unintended noise, you know, doorbells, dogs barking, things like that. Uh, if you have to, if you would like to ask a question, uh, just type it in the uh, chat. But if you type it in the chat box, make sure, looks like somebody already is. Um, make sure, cool, thanks Ann, I'll read that in a minute. Make sure that you put it to everyone, not just to the author, so that I can pick them up and read them as we go along or some of the other people, other participants can and, and help me out. And of course, Ray, if you wanna watch them too, that also helps. Um, feel free to interact with Ray. One of our goals for the GCLS Online Book Club is to promote our fabulous authors and their works, but also to continue to build our community and, you know, hook everybody together and everybody gets to enjoy the books. So now I'm going to read your bio. Go you for ready? it. Okay. Ray D. Magden, which I learned is an anagram, right? Is that what you told me? Yeah. Okay writes queer speculative fiction. She believes everyone deserves to be a hero, especially lesbians, bisexuals, trans women, non-binary folks, and women of color. Her recent cyberpunk novel, Lucky Seven, won a 2019 goalie for science fiction fantasy, as well as a 2019 Rainbow Award. Her profile on archive of her own contains over 350 unique works of free fan fiction. And again, I mentioned this before we started recording and people joined, but I really want to talk about that because I'm really excited about fan fiction and how that works. All right, tell us something about your books. Hi, uh, I'm Ray, as you probably know, because <laughs> hopefully you read my book. <laughs> um, I have been writing full time since I was 24, so about six years now. And I've published 12 books. Uh, actually, I think uh, I think Lucky Eight is number thirteen. Uh, it just released yesterday. It's a direct sequel to Lucky Seven, and uh, this is the very very special proof copy. Uh, but it's in uh, digital and hardback formats. It's coming soon to Smashwords and iBooks and Kobo, in addition to Amazon and Desert Palm Press and uh, the Bella Books uh, distri distribution website. So. Really excited. I've been working on Lucky Eight for three years and I think it's my best one yet. So awesome. I really hope that uh, if you enjoyed Lucky Seven, consider picking up a copy. I'm gonna be reading the first uh, bit of it so you can get a taste, but it features the same characters. And uh, I like to term it hope punk because it is cyberpunk in that there are corporations, capitalism run, run amok, it's kind of a dystopian society, but despite that, these characters find uh, reasons to keep going and reasons to see beauty in the world, and they form attachments and relationships anyway, in spite of that. So that's why I like to call it hope punk instead of just cyberpunk. 
Oh, the nihilism isn't isn't quite there the same way. Yeah, cool. I love it. Well, if you want to go ahead and start reading, we're ready to hear it. Cool. All right. This is from Sasha's perspective. The, the book uh, Lucky Seven starts with Elena and transitions to Sasha. And this one starts with Sasha and transitions to Elena in the second half. Okay. Chapter one, I stare at the blinding billboards of SLKC, familiarity, <laughs> familiarity weighing heavily on my shoulders. The products featured in the ad rings surrounding the skylines have changed over the past decade, but the lights look the same. Bright neon beams bounce off each other, merging into a muddy brown shadow. The gateway arch stands in the distance a silver half oval illuminated by constant ad cycles. Below our shuttle, the nighttime crowd trickles along climate controlled walkways, following their tributaries like the sluggish waters of the Missouri River. There are more walkways since my last visit with new ones under construction. When I was growing up, they were a luxury. They're a necessity these days, thanks to rising temperatures and superstorms. The eagle soars high above the ground, but I don't need to hear the city to remember how it sounds. Beneath the roar of air traffic and the rumble of the transit tunnels is the persistent hum of the power grid. When older sections of the grid overload, everything pauses, eerily reminiscent of a stuttering heartbeat. Of course, that never happens at the poles where we are now. The East and West business districts have backup generators for their backup generators. You good, Sasha? A warm hand covers mine on the shared armrest. Elena glances at me from the seat to my left, her brown eyes worried. Usually, looking at her makes me happier than I've been in a long time. But even that heart-shaped face and those soft, full lips aren't enough to make me forget why I'm upset. Maybe nervous is a better description. We're here to awaken a piece of my past that I would much rather keep dormant. I'm fine, I tell Elena. She's nosy, but even she must sense this isn't the time to pry. We've got bad memories buried here, me and Sasha. Cherry, our wrench, says. Rami and Doc, our cloak and our medic, have occupied the forward-facing pilot seats, leaving Cherry directly across from me in the back. Unfortunately, that makes ignoring her all the more difficult. Rock, our grunt, is buckled in beside Cherry, he tilts his head, but as usual, the big guy doesn't say much. Cherry continues staring at me, her heavily made up green eyes full of expectation beneath her bright red bangs. I press my lips together, refusing to take the bait. Elena speaks up though, because of course she does. This is where you and Sasha met, right, Cherry? Yeah, after Sasha made her break from Oc Prep, I'd already uh, left KC Tech a few months earlier. I stifle a groan. I have no interest in rehashing that particular period, but according to Cherry, uh, but ordering Cherry to shut up will only stoke Elena's curiosity. She's seen flashes of the memories stored in my brain box, but according to her, they're disparate fragments, more emotion than story. That's probably a good thing. The details make me uncomfortable sometimes and I'm the one who lived them. Elena arches an eyebrow at Cherry. Que pero? Cherry shrugs. Why did I leave? Eh, there might have been a teensy explosion when I dropped out. Wasn't nearly as dramatic as Sasha's exit from boarding school, though. I glare at Cherry and remove my hand from beneath Elena's. That was over 17 years ago. Annoyance flickers in Elena's eyes, but behind that is a kicked puppy dog look she can't quite hide. Damn her for being cute. I reclaim her hand, squeezing to show I'm not pissed at her, just on edge. Rami, what's our ETA? I ask. Rami peers around the edge of their seat to meet my eyes. They're dressed fairly feminine today with a hairless face and crisp purple cat eye liner. Their sleek black hair is pulled into a perfect French braid. Impatient, are we? It'll be at least another five minutes, my lovelies. Rami brings the eagle out of the sky lanes, merging into a ground level lane that runs alongside the walkways. Pedestrians scurry along like too many hamsters squished into a single tube, not bothering to glance up at passing traffic. Which entrance are we using today, boss lady? Rami asks. 
So far, there's no sign that Axis Generations is following us, but it's in my nature to be cautious. Of all the bolt holes around the globe, the ones in SLKC and Siberia are the ones my crew can least afford to reveal to the corporations. Siberia is where our crewmate Val, the only fully realized artificial intelligence in existence, keeps her primary servers. SLKC houses Val's backup servers, as well as the person we've come to pick up. The south entrance, I tell Rami, traffic's thinner. Rami changes course without comment. I don't get why you're so freaked out, Doc says, craning her neck to look back at me from the co-pilot's chair. It's just another mission, right? Her blue eyes are worried behind her visor, and I can tell she isn't ribbing me because she's 13 and that's what teenagers do. She's fishing for information, trying to figure out whether I'm being cautious or if I'm actually afraid. I am afraid, but not of access generations. They aren't the first triple diamond corporation to try and kill me, and I'm still alive, in a sense. I'm afraid for more existential reasons. Afraid the person we're meeting won't be happy to see me. Afraid I won't be happy to see her either, even though coming here was my idea. I've been itching to do this since the worst of the heat from Access Gen died down. It's probably too soon, but I've been gnawing on it like a dog with a bone, missing sleep and dreaming about it. Doc watches me, probably waiting for some kind of reassurance. SLKC wasn't always good to me, I offer, an admitted, ad, admittedly pitiful response. Elena always says dragging words out of me is like pulling teeth, which is pretty accurate. Back at it again with the cryptic shit, huh? Doc flops back in her chair. Don't worry, I'll break you eventually. Sure you will, kid. Nice. That was great. Yes, bravo, bravo. I'm excited now. I'm going to get, get my copy and read that because I, I just really enjoyed the first one. Not always my genre, so it was just really nice and refreshing to read. So I'm glad I did. But I'm yeah. so happy you enjoyed it. Yeah, I did. And I want to ask you about Sasha later too. Um, so I have a few questions that got emailed in. I'm going to start with those if you're, if you're all right with that. Go um, for it. Okay. So one the first question, uh, people wanted to know how you determine the skills of your team. So, you know, you just kind of hit on some of them as you introduce them, reintroduce them in the next book, but how, how come that team? Well, uh, there's a video game series called Mass Effect. And one of the tropes that Mass Effect does very well, it's a space opera. You're the commander of a ship and you have a crew. Uh, one of the tropes that Mass Effect does very well is uh, gathering the crew. So yeah. I sat down and I thought about what kind of uh, crews do a lot of these space operas have? I know this is cyberpunk, but still. Uh, and, you know, there's usually an engineer of some kind, someone who builds the machines. Uh, there has to be a hacker because it's cyberpunk. Right, <laughs> and right. that's a hallmark of the genre. There's usually a, a big beefy guy uh, who takes the big hits and uh, stands in front. And, uh, you know, it's just really hard to take down. And yeah. uh, there's usually a leader. So, uh, and there's usually some kind of spy, someone who is able to disguise themselves and sneak in places, an infiltrator of sorts. Right. So that's kind of what I started with. And then uh, I decided on medic for Doc because I wanted her to be in the field, but I also wanted to put a little bit of distance between her and combat because she's okay. 13, she's a kid. Right. Right. And uh, that actually becomes an issue in Lucky Eight that Sasha has to consider how she feels about this kid being part of her crew and potentially being in danger and getting injured. So um, what, what happens when the medic gets injured? Yeah. Is, uh, is kind of the, the reason that I went that route with Doc. Nice. And having the brother sister thing was kind of cool. Kind of gave yeah, them a, I a cool to, bond. I wanted to showcase lots of different kinds of relationships. Uh, obviously, I really love writing romantic relationships between women. That's my favorite thing to do. But I wanted to showcase 
sibling relationships. I wanted to showcase, uh, and Lucky Eight goes further into that, showcasing different kinds of family, whether you're related by blood or your uh, chosen family, which can be even stronger sometimes. Gotcha. Nice, cool. That was a good one. Uh, the inspiration to write the story. So you told us a little bit, and actually, it's not just a story; it's a series. So why did you decide? It is now to go a with series. This? Yes, now a series. Fantastic. But what inspired you? Well, I've always liked cyberpunk as a genre. I like the idea of hackers and uh, virtual heists and virtual reality in general, because you can have whole worlds inside the internet. Uh, right. But I always found the genre kind of hard to read because it was so depressing. Mm -hmm. Cyberpunk is usually a really depressing genre. It, you know, the world has gone to shit and it'll never get any better. So I decided since there wasn't a lot of cyberpunk that had a hopeful bent that acknowledges how shitty the world is, but tells you that it's worth it to try to live and love anyway. So I went into Lucky Seven with a really clear idea of making cyberpunk more hopeful. And that's why I like to call it hope punk. Yeah. Because I love the dystopian setting. I love the other themes, the themes of what makes us human, uh, all that kind of cool stuff. But yeah. the nihilism was just too much for me in a lot of these books. So, yeah. you know, it's a <laughs> Ocean's Eleven mixed with Blade Runner, mixed with a dash of positivity for a change. And I think queer people really need that positivity, especially. Yeah, 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 I like that. Hope, hope punk, is that what you're calling it? Hope punk? Yeah. I like that. All right, we have one more about Val. So what, what exactly is Val? I mean, she, we know she's artificial intelligence, but she's like super kind of it. So how do we come up with Val and what is she actually? So artificial intelligences at their base level, we deal with them every day. They are uh, coded programs that are capable of learning and self-modifying based on the data that they intake. So an algorithm to uh, focus advertisements could be an artificial intelligence. Uh, okay. depending on what, uh, how complex it is. But the other uh, thing about that is eventually there is a line that gets crossed and the artificial intelligence starts having opinions. It starts having feelings uh, and uh, becoming, asking questions like, who am I? What am I here for? Okay. So I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Some books definitely show it as a bad thing. I think it can be a dangerous thing, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. So in the term, in the spirit of hope punk, I decided to make an artificial intelligence that was not bad. And she is called a fully realized artificial intelligence. That is a term I made up to distinguish her from a piece of code that is self-modifying to do its job better. Uh, so she started out kind of like that, but then as she took data in, she became complex to the point where she gained sentience, which is uh, the hallmark of a, of a fray, an F-R-A-I, as opposed to a just a regular artificial intelligence that would help you steer the ship or aim a weapon. Mm. Okay, that's cool. And then you came up with that yourself. I like that. That's, that's very cool. Fully realized, nice. Yeah, yeah, she she's... has uh, servers, like, um, you know, server towers, and they are kept in Siberia, which is cold enough for them to work at their full capacity. She also has backup servers that are in St. Louis, Kansas City, which is the city where all of Lucky 8 takes place. All right, that's cool. Lucky 7 was cool where you went all over the place, though. That was kind yeah, of Yeah, I deliberately but... wanted to stay in, like, one city for this book to show what a city is like in this world. Because mm. I did like the globe trotting in Lucky Seven and I wouldn't change it, but I wanted to go in a different direction with Lucky Eight. Gotcha, that makes sense, that makes sense. All right, so before we get to some of the chat, we're gonna get some questions over there in the chat. Um, my question is, I absolutely fell in love with Sasha. I mean, 
what an amazing dynamic character. So, I mean, where, where did she come from? I mean, what is she based on? I mean, she's so memorable and so strong, but so vulnerable at the same time. I just really like Sasha. So I want, I want to talk about Sasha. I don't know about the rest of y'all, but well, tell me about her. Sasha and Elena are my two favorite characters I've ever written in anything. So yeah. they're my, they're my babies. Uh, Sasha, I wanted someone who seemed cold and uncaring at first glance. Elena describes her in chapter one of Lucky Seven, like uh, she looks like if death decided it wanted a body one day. Right. And so that's what she looks like. But what she really is, is someone who has a huge capacity to love her family. And when she doesn't have her blood family anymore, she builds her own family. Mm -hmm. And she will do anything to the point of sacrificing her life in increasingly painful ways multiple times right. to protect them. And so that's why I did the point of view switch in the book, uh, because okay. I wanted to write a character that came off a bit cold and uh, harsh and, uh, you know, deadly. But then if you look past that a little bit, she's the, she has the biggest heart of anybody in the book. And right. uh, she just desperately wants to be loved. She's very strong but she also wants approval, even mm -hmm. though she pretends she doesn't. So <laughs> um, I definitely gave her my depression and issues of low self-worth. I'm sorry, Sasha. <laughs> and that's what I really tapped into when I was writing her is, uh, you know, those dark feelings where you think you're not good enough. Yeah. But her crew loves her and her family loves her and she succeeds at a lot of the things she tries to do. And she eventually comes to realize that she is worthy yeah. So that's the kind of character arc I want to see for characters with low self-worth. I gotcha. definitely wow. wanted to give her some positivity. Gotcha. Well, um, on the flip side of that, I'm, I'm going to say uh, the bitch Megan. Oh my gosh. Did not like her very much, but she was definitely the perfect opposite, you know, and, and gave a lot of backstory about why Sasha was vulnerable because of how she was treated so i didn't like her but i liked her so you know how it you works. liked not liking her. exactly she was a great villain she was a great villain all right so let's see what's going over here on the chat so we got Anne was saying this the first time she saw the cover and it reminded her of alien ride at wdw Walt, Walt disney, disney world, world. Oh, okay sorry and it's very cool i agree that cover is very cool and uh, Dolores, I don't have my glasses on. I think that's what it says. Blew my mind when I found out, LOL, that's great. And thank you. It's not the only one who, not the only one who feels that way. I think and, uh, that was in response to cyberpunk being really depressing sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And it can be, it can be. Those dystopian worlds can be tough. Um, and that's, Anne's also like you blazing new trails. That's great. And another one about cyberpunk being depressing, okay. So do we have a question? Anybody else want to talk about either book or just about Ray in general? I mean, she's on the hot seat now. She can't get away. So I'm happy to answer questions and talk about, I love talking about my favorite series that I made so far. So this is your favorite? This is your favorite <laughs> oh, series? Oh yeah, then? absolutely. Lucky nice. seven and lucky eight are my favorite things I've ever written. And there's going to be a third book in the trilogy. I don't know if it'll be called lucky nine. That's the working title, but right. We'll see. <laughs> nice. But that's always fun to get really get into a, a series. I'm just glad I didn't have to think of a title for Lucky Eight. It was already self explanatory. <laughs> yeah, it was right. already obvious what I was going to call it because titling a novel is the worst part, I swear. Yes, it can be for sure. Anne, you have a question? I, for people don't, that don't know, Ray has significant roots in fan. Oh, fan and fiction. I want her to, her to talk about that, Yes, um, if you would. <laughs> yeah, we can segue to that because I have the question about that too. We were talking before we started the, the meeting. Tell me about fan fiction. Tell us about fan fiction. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know, fan fiction is when you write a story uh, about a piece of media somebody else made. Okay. So if you like Terry Pratchett, or if you like the TV show Xena, that's where a lot of stuff started in fandom. Or if you like uh, 
the TV show She-Ra or any, any book or movie or TV show, uh, and you want to write a story about what happens to those characters, uh, that's fan fiction. Hmm. There's a really great website called Archive of Our Own. And Archive of Our Own is a uh, user-owned, fan-owned, uh, it's basically a storage space where you can look up fan fictions for free, written mm -hmm. for free, reading is free, uh, by what they're made for. Like if you like the TV show Xena, you can go to the Xena page and it'll have sorting features so you can look, you can get very specific about what you wanna read. Uh, you mm -hmm. could look for erotic stories. You could look for stories with no character death. You can cross out the tag character death if you don't wanna read something sad. Mm -hmm. So Archive of Our Own is a great organization, 100% free to use, free to make an account, free to post stories. And uh, I've written over 350 stories on Archive of Our Own for many wow. different TV shows and books and movies and games, video games. And uh, that's where I cut my teeth writing. It's where I learned how to write. It's uh -huh. where I built an audience that now follows me on social media and buys my books. It's where I learned how to put a plot together. It's where I learned how to write sex scenes. It's where I learned how to make people care about your characters. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I've learned, I owe to fan fiction. And I don't post as much as I used to back in 2014 because I'm writing my own books now. Right. But uh, I still post uh, because I think it's important. One of the radical things about fan fiction is it's free, completely free. And it lets you uh, exclude tags that might be disturbing to you. And it lets you look for tags that are important to you. Like you can pick the fem slash tag if you only want to read about women who are in relationships with other women. So it's very specific and granular like that. And it's uh, accessible to anybody who has the internet. So I want to make sure that people who can't shell out the 650 for lucky eight still have something to read about sapphic women written by a uh, bisexual woman. So that's why I still do fan fiction. So how long are they? I mean, fan fiction, is it like novel? They can be anywhere from 1,000 word drabbles to several novels worth of words. Wow. And I wow. have written both kinds. Based on other characters. Yep, based on other people's characters. Wow. And there's nothing uh, illegal or wrong or fan about fan fiction. It's a wonderful, beautiful thing that lots of authors and uh, content creators encourage because it makes people mm -hmm. more excited about the original material. Okay, that makes sense. And as long as you're not uh, putting it up on Amazon and selling it saying, I invented this, then right. it's completely legal. And uh, Archive of Our Own has a team of lawyers to make sure that uh, the fair use clause in US copyright law allows fan fiction to exist. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, that makes sense. I would, I would, I understand that how that. Yeah, as actually... long as you don't say I made this pay me, right. then it's totally fine. And people will still buy the original material. Sometimes fan fiction brings in new viewers and readers, even hmm. it can increase a show's popularity. Right. That makes sense. I, I can see how that would work. Well, cool. I've, never tried it so maybe I'll maybe I'll give it a shot so you just pick some uh, characters that you really like from some other media and you write a story about them or an original story about them yeah but you can do what's called an alternate universe which means that say uh they are in high school in the original media okay. uh, you could put them on a spaceship and write a completely different story um you could put them back in time. Uh, hmm. You can do anything you want, or you could write a scene that happens between episodes that you wish you had seen, but they didn't put it in the story. So it can be very close to what's called canon, which is the original material, or it can be wildly different from canon. Hmm. Okay, thank you very much for that. I did not know that about everybody else, but I learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah, my username, I'm... someone asked what my username is. It is Ray D. Magden. I'll type it in chat. And my favorite show to write about, oh, that's hard. Uh, I really enjoy The Legend of Korra, which is a TV show. Uh, I like writing about the characters Korra and Asami, who are two bisexual women in a relationship. 
I also really like writing about the game Mass Effect. I mentioned it before, it's a space opera where you role play as the commander of a, of a ship and save the galaxy. Uh, I really like writing about Commander Shepard and uh, her girlfriend who is an alien named Liara. So I've written a lot for Mass Effect and Legend of Korra. I think those are my two biggest fandoms that I've put the most stories in. Gotcha. Well, maybe I'll write one between Sasha and Val. <laughs> you should, if you want Sasha and Val to be together, you should. <laughs> yeah, I can't say it'll made... happen in the books. But... Yeah, that's true. I don't want to take anything out of the books, but that would be Yeah, too sometimes people write uh, different pairings than were in the books. And I think it's a great expression of creativity. I have a friend, uh, one of my sensitivity readers likes the, the pairing of Elena and Cherry. And oh. I always tease her <laughs> because I'm like, that's not in the original books, but I think it's great if she wants yeah. to write a story about Elena and Cherry. I 100% support it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, what was Elena's younger brother's name? I can't remember. Uh, he has two, uh, Jacobo and Mateo. Okay, so we met Jacobo. So Jacobo and Doc. I have toyed with that. Yeah. I can't guarantee it'll happen, but you know, they're the same age. Yeah, I know. I, I like that. And they already had a little sparring going on, so... Yeah, I would, I would not hate that if that happened. I um, have some more questions here. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite scene in the story? Ooh, ah, okay. Favorite sex scene is definitely the shower scene. Yeah. It's a good <laughs> you scene. You didn't ask favorite sex scene, but. <laughs> so, um, but favorite scene overall, I really like the scene where Elena discovers that Sasha has died six times mm, and okay. she connects to Sasha's brain box and plugs it in to her Jack and she witnesses Sasha dying. It completely, I love that part of the book because she realizes that Sasha has sacrificed herself six separate times in painful ways to save her crew. And that I think is the moment where she really grows attached to Sasha because how can you not be attached to someone that does that, that someone right. is, is that caring? How can you not be impressed? Yeah. And that flip, I planned that from the very beginning. And I love when it flips that way. And then you go into Sasha's point of view and you realize what a big heart she has. So right. that's one of my favorite parts of the book. Yeah, that was, that was kind of a mind bending part for me. That was cool. Yeah. We also have uh, what's next for you. Well, uh, I am working on a fantasy novel called Song of Stars. Wow. It is about two young girls who are best friends since they're like five or six years old. They go to a place called the Temple of Dreams. This is a fantasy world where they uh, train their voices. They're both singers, but one has a magical voice that can heal wounds and call animals, kind of like a Disney princess. <laughs> she has a magical voice that performs miracles. And the other girl, Safina, the viewpoint character, does not have a magic voice. She's very good, but she's not a miracle worker. And as they grow up, uh, they fall in love, but they have the same teacher, the same mentor, who is always putting Mireille, the one with the magical voice first, and so it's kind of about, it's a love story between two people who are always pitted against each other. And uh, Safina then has to deal with her simultaneous love and jealousy toward the person she loves most in the world. And she kind of has to sort that out. And meanwhile, of course, uh, there is uh, lots of social justice stuff in it, which I'm a big fan of because uh, Murray is one of the sea people. She is uh, from a a minority, an ethno-religious minority that worships a specific uh, god that the rest of the people in the city don't worship. And so uh, she, as she becomes more and more radical, uh, Safina gets in more and more trouble mm -hmm. and uh, has to figure out how to uh, stop the city from erupting into chaos and how to deal with her jealousy. But if you like uh, enemy, if you like fr best friends to lovers, to enemies, to back to lovers, you're gonna like this book. Nice, fit it all in there, that's awesome. Yeah, that sounds cool. 
Um, yeah, you have to read these because I <laughs> my glasses are over there. So. Uh, all right. We have uh, to create a whole new way of the world like you do in the book. Do you come up with it on your own or do you do some sort of research? Ooh, that's a good question. So I come up with the idea usually on my own, usually based on a question. My question for Lucky Seven was, what makes you, you? What makes you an individual? Um, and I asked myself, is it your memories? Uh, are the some experiences you've had from when you were born to where you are now the reason that you are who you are? And what happens if some of those memories get deleted? Are you still yeah. the same person? What happens if you are in a different body, but with the same memories? Are you still the same person? So that's the question I used to come up with the character of Sasha and the plot of Lucky Seven. And also Val, is she a person? Uh, she has feelings and she has memories, So, but she doesn't have a physical body with DNA. Uh, do servers count as a body? Uh, so things like that. Uh, I wanted to answer those questions. And then for research, <laughs> one of the things I did was I Googled um, cool inventions that were coming out. Uh, the, the specialized gloves that the crew uses to climb walls mm -hmm. uh, are actually a thing that's being invented uh, by certain labs around the country. They are based on gecko hands. They have tiny microscopic ridges in the gloves and you can use them to like sucker your way up walls. Hmm. So that is a real thing. Uh, Rami's light refracting belt, which bends the light around them so that uh, they're difficult to see. That is a real thing that people are trying to develop. So I looked up cool inventions and I uh, took them to the next level because this is in the future. And that's how I came up with a lot of the cool uh, stuff for lucky eight it's based on real technology that's fun that's totally fun i want those gloves that sounds awesome climb up to like spider-man let's see what inspired your next work i think that's about song of stars well uh she -Ra and the princesses of power did a really really beautiful arc between the main character adora and her best friend katra they are best friends, grew up together, have the same abusive mentor figure acting as their mom. But then they find themselves on opposite sides of a war because, uh, because Tatra wants to continue becoming more powerful so no one can ever hurt her again. And Adora wants to break away from the place where she was born, where she was raised because she's realized it's evil and she didn't know. So they eventually are on the same side again, not till the very end, but going from best friends to enemies to then love was really a great arc. And I wanted to do something similar where, but make it even more painful because uh, Safina and Murray are lovers before they split up on opposite sides of an issue. And it's a really complicated relationship between them. And I really wanted to feature that relationship. Also, it was uh, Song of Stars was definitely inspired by my own life. Before I was a writer full-time and an author, I was a musician. I played the flute. That is what my bachelor's degree is in, is flute performance. And that world, that hyper-competitive musical world where your teachers simultaneously are your biggest cheerleaders and they love you and they almost act like your parents. And you're, it's like a master and apprentice situation. And so you get really, you get these really big emotional relationships with your teachers, but sometimes those relationships aren't healthy. Sometimes yeah. your teacher, when they're criticizing your music, they end up criticizing you instead as a person. Okay. You don't work hard enough. You aren't good mm -hmm. enough. And so I had a complicated relationship with several of my flute instructors. And I incorporated that into the book with the character of Lady Lirath because she is their mentor. She is their mother because they live with her and she's their primary caretaker. Uh, but she's always pitting them against each other. And in music school, you get pitted against your friends, sometimes your best friends. And sometimes that can fracture a relationship. I've seen it happen. 
Sure. So this is definitely taken from my life and my experience as a musician going to conservatory. Hmm. That's always good when you can bring bring your own uh, history into it. That always helps a lot. It makes it more authentic. So that's cool. It's very cool. We have another one. Can you talk about how you draw on the fandoms you love as inspiration for your original writing? I love that you're part of the new generation of creators that aren't ashamed to discuss your fanish origins. Yeah, I think fan fiction is great. The only reason fan fiction is sometimes not as good as original fiction is because anyone can post fan fiction. You don't have to get past an editor to post. But the best of the best fan fiction is just as good as the best of the best published works. There are some amazingly talented people doing it. So I'm never ashamed of fan fiction. There's some beautiful stuff out there that easily rivals any published work. Gotcha. But so the reason, uh, the way that I like to draw from fan fiction is I usually take a concept. I discussed this before. Uh, I really liked the trope that she did of best friends becoming enemies and then coming back together again. So I took that basic idea and then I created completely different characters and a completely different world and a completely different plot. So I will usually take the one thing I find the most compelling about a piece of media and then build a whole new world around it. Uh, Safina is very different than Katra, even though she's the one who's left behind. Uh, she is shy. She is uh, deferential and submissive until she isn't. She never thinks she's good enough. Uh, and she has really low self-esteem. And I don't think Katra is quite on that level. She covers up her low self-esteem by being mean. And it's a defense mechanism. Safina covers up her lower self-esteem by trying desperately to please any authority figure she can. Um, obviously she grows up and improves that behavior, but just to, just to highlight some of the ways in which I made it different. And with uh, Lucky Seven, back to, <laughs> back to Lucky Seven, uh, the inspiration from Mass Effect primarily came from the idea of a crew of people with each, uh, each having their own skill, getting together and forming a family. So I took that nugget, that little gold nugget from the, from the river of Mass Effect and then threw it in a different river. <laughs> it's cyberpunk as opposed to space opera. The characters are completely different than the Mass Effect characters. Like there's no equivalent for Doc in Mass Effect. There's no kid medic. Uh, and the uh, character of Rami who is so flexible with their gender presentation and uh, can go invisible, that's not really a big thing in Mass Effect either. So uh, there's no pyromaniac in Mass Effect, but the idea, the basic idea of uh, getting the crew together and doing a mission where you might not come back, that is definitely Mass Effect inspired. Well, that's an, I mean, that's a lot of different places where that, you know, you're going to go on a mission and you might not Yeah, it's one of my favorite tropes. It definitely yeah. is in more than just Mass Effect, but yeah. that's what I was referencing for sure. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah, the seed of an idea. I like it. <clears throat> Here's one. Uh, you use Patreon. What do you have there on Patreon that's not in your books or archive of our own? Good question. So first of all, uh, Patreon, the higher tiers, uh, I will ship a free autographed book to your home with a personalized message uh, in the highest tier. And uh, that is to thank the people who support me for basically making my dream of being a full-time writer a reality. It is a big part of my income. Uh, another fun story that updates only on Patreon is The Blood Bride. There are seven chapters so far, including audio. I narrate, uh, better than I read today, I narrate the story. It is about a snow elf named Valis, who is the queen. Her mom has died and she has to perform a blood ritual every month or her kingdom will uh, be destroyed. It's an ancient ritual she has to do every month or her kingdom is gone. Uh, she needs someone to give her blood to do this ritual. So she finds a wife. Uh, this wife is Bryn Woodwarden, she is a uh, 
a wood elf, she knows nothing about life at court or being uh, a princess or part of the nobility. She just likes to go tromping off in the woods with sticks in her hair and shoot her bow at things and go hunting and uh, live in her tiny, tiny village by the river. So she uh, ends up being Valis's arranged marriage because she has, I haven't revealed why yet in the story, but she has a very powerful magical blood. So she and Valis have an arranged marriage. And at first they don't like each other, but seven chapters in, they are slowly starting to like and appreciate each other and understand, even though they're very, very different, that they have some stuff in common. So it's funny, it, it goes with a lot of the arranged marriage, uh, fake dating kind of tropes, mm. uh, because they have to pretend that they really care about each other, even though it's completely a political marriage. And of course they eventually fall in love, obviously. Of yes, nice. So how long are those little episodes? Uh, each chapter, there are seven chapters so far, and each chapter is about 4,000 words, maybe a little oh. more. Nice. And the audio files for each chapter, which I narrate and are uh, available to pat patrons, are about 20 minutes long each. And I mm -hmm. post a new chapter every month. Wow. Yeah, you write a lot. That's that's really cool. Yeah, I hadn't heard it. I, hadn't, I mean, I'd heard about it, but I didn't know much about it. So that's great. That's great. Yeah, um, someone asked if there will be more stories like this one on Patreon. Uh, absolutely. I definitely plan to do more things like The Blood Bride in the future. I'm very excited to start sharing serial novels that way. And then maybe someday, a couple of years down the line, I'll release it as an actual book. But uh, for now, only on Patreon. Uh, and it's one of the ways that I say thank you to all of my supporters. And then the other thing I do, all fan fiction should be free, I think, mm -hmm. because it's important for it to be accessible and you're using characters from somebody else. But I have a poll every month and people who support me can vote in the poll on what they want me to write. So they can okay. kind of choose, do you want me to write Korasami uh, Samba dancing? Do you want me to write uh, Shepard and Liara in an alternate universe where uh, the Asari, Liara's people have conquered the galaxy? Do they want me to write uh, Shira and the Princesses of Power in high school? They get to uh, suggest what I write next. Very so nice. that way, all the fan fiction is still posted for free on Archive of Our Own. So anybody can read it without any, at, free of charge. Gotcha. But you get, to, you get to make suggestions. Right. That's part of the privilege. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So there's a poll. There's the Blood Bride Arranged Marriage. Uh, you get signed physical copies if you're at the highest tier shipped to your home with a personalized message and autograph. Uh, you get digital copies of my new releases hmm. uh, if you are the second highest tier. And you also get access to my work in progress folder where you can see, uh, you can peek at what I'm working on. I posted the first uh, part of Song of Stars, my rough draft that I wrote in November so people could watch me write. Hmm. That's cool. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, let's see, how are we doing? Have we caught up? Did we miss any as we went along? Someone says, it's a great story, The Blood Bride. So I'm very happy that you like it. Nice. I love The Blood Bride. I love that Bryn is just like a walking gremlin who doesn't know how to do anything when she's, about, when she's in the palace and she just accidentally offends all the important people. Gotcha. Um, let's see. We talked about fan fiction. We talked about Patreon. That's cool. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the, oh, we got another one. I was yeah. going to have you. Are you to participating have you plug yourself. on any panels during the virtual con? I don't know yet. They haven't announced them yet. No, no. <laughs> but I submitted an application to be considered for whatever panels they think I might be qualified for. Yeah. Yeah. Those I would love to soon. participate. Yeah. Yeah. People are uh, submitting those now, so we should. We'll know soon. I also submitted the moderator application. So hopefully I'll be moderating some panels. I hope you'll come check it out. Yes. Yeah, Anne likes that. Yeah, my favorite, my favorite panel for GCLS I ever moderated was the one with Melinda Lowe for children's literature. That was a great panel. That was a bomb ass panel. Gotcha. We're gonna have a lot of panels. So I'm sure you'll get on one and be a moderator somewhere. 
<clears throat> All right. So I want to know about your contact information. So you can maybe start putting some stuff in the chat or whatever you want to do. Absolutely. So people, can, people can connect so, with you. So my Twitter is Ray D. Magden. My Tumblr is Ray D. Magden. My website. RadyMagnon.com. I just uh, brushed up the website, so it's shiny and new. Uh, my Facebook. Take a take a wild guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is most of my my uh, social media. If you want to email me for any reason, my email is Rady Magden. <laughs> I'm Rady Magden everywhere. So uh, how do we find you on Patreon though? Because I'm, I'm oh, really curious yes, about that. Yes, that's another good. Uh, yeah, I need to check that out. It's Rady Magden. <laughs> and that is a big way I make my income. So thank you to everyone who supports me on uh, Patreon. And I can't wait to release even more fun stuff there. Yeah, it sounds very cool. I definitely gotta check that out. Very cool. Yep, and then- what I thought there was one more. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I can't remember. Oh, well. What, on your social media? Yeah, I think that's it. I think Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, my website, my email, Patreon. You don't do Instagram? Oh, uh, let me let me get the archive of our own link where all my free fan fiction is. Cool. Let me see if I can copy these. There we go. Oh, that's my inbox. Sorry. I don't want my inbox. I want my works. Are these the same Use the ones second that, link. Okay. Are these the same ones that you gave me to, where I put it against your profile when I listed about the book club? Because uh, you sent yeah, me I think a so. block. Okay. So I'll make sure that we get those. I'll repost those in the book club as, a, as an actual uh, comment or post. So that if people aren't writing them down fast, <clears throat> fast enough, I'll make sure they get up there. I just, if you search Rady Magden, you will find me. And I would also, uh, I would like to make a very, uh, very earnest request. If you liked Lucky Seven, then please leave me a review on Amazon. <laughs> it really, really helps me get new readers. And also it helps me uh, get credit with places like BookBub. So if I want to mm -hmm. run an advertisement for Lucky 8, uh, they look at the reviews for Lucky 7 and see how many reviews I have and how many stars I have to decide who to pick right. for, their, uh, for their advertisement. So it really helps me uh, get new readers, convince them to uh, give the book a try. And it also helps me with advertising because lots of these places where you advertise look at your, uh, your reviews for the book you're trying to put on sale. So sure. Sure. even sure. if it's just a short review, like this had really compelling characters and a cool setting, I loved it. That is still huge for me. Yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be 10 paragraphs long. It can be two sentences, but Goodreads, Amazon, social media, two sentences absolutely helps me so much. So if you liked it, please leave a review. Yes. Yes, 1000% true, yes. Um, so this has been awesome. We have a few more minutes. I also wanna talk about the next uh, book club, but we came up with what's coming up next, where to find your books. I don't have anything else on my list. Is there anything else for anybody in the audience? Any last minute questions? That's right, before we move on to the, the next plug. I really have enjoyed having you on here. And I've really enjoyed the book. I, I'm, I'm really a big fan now and I want to hear more about Sasha for sure. So. Well, then maybe, you should pick up Lucky 8 because it's oh, out I will. today. I know, I will totally pick it up. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the Amazon link yes. in the chat for Lucky 8. And the more people jump on Lucky 8, uh, like right now that it's out, uh, the higher it'll go in the rankings and the more new people will see it when they browse lesbian fiction or lesbian sci-fi. So right, yeah, get right on now it's person. at, what is it at right now? It's number nine in LGBT science fiction. So I'd like to get it to number one. That would be really cool. 
that would be cool. Let's do that. Let's totally do that. I'm going to get it. Yeah. But I didn't really enjoy the book and I really enjoyed the characters. They were awesome. Okay. Oh, somebody just bought it like just right now. So that's awesome. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. I really hope you enjoy it. Thanks. But yeah, talk, talk about who's coming up next. Who's going to be featured? Um, well, first, thank you very much. I want to say again, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. I, I did have a good time. And I mean, we didn't talk about the sex scenes much with everybody on the recording, but. Ah, know. yeah. Well, <laughs> the sex scenes, I think, are a really great character development tool that some people are afraid of. But yeah. it's actually a really useful thing sometimes. And so I think that uh, I wish it is totally fine for books not to have sex scenes. That's great too. But if a book has a sex scene, I think that sometimes it's not just about being sexy. Sometimes it's about looking at, at a character's heart and their innermost thoughts. And that's always very fun for me to explore. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, all right, so up next, uh, we have actually the first time we've ever done this is we're gonna have an audiobook narrator. So rather than actually have a book we're talking about, we're talking to a narrator and it happens to be the very popular Abby Creighton. So Abby Creighton Ooh. will be beyond here talking about her life as a narrator, the different books she's done, also some of the stuff she does other than just do audiobook narration. So that'll be, uh, let me make sure I have the date right. That will be next April 3rd. So the first Saturday in April and again at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and the last thing I want to say, of course, is that uh, you can register for that through the book club, obviously, under the website. Uh, events also available on goldencrown.org. But we appreciate all your feedback. And so what I would, I would like to plug on our own is there is actually a uh, group that you can be in. If you're not already, you probably should be. That's how you're seeing all this. But please comment. Give me more feedbacks, other people you'd like to see, uh, always questions, things like that. That helps a lot to make the book club even better. So, all right, I'm gonna sign off. Thank you everybody for showing up. I really appreciated having you here and have a really great rest of your Saturday. Thank you all, I had so much fun. Yes.